accompaniment given by Mr. Steve Turner. Bravo. <laughs> Once in a lifetime then. Um, I'd love to um, bring up our panelists right now. Um, and I also want to note once again that we are very, very thankful from the Outfest UCLA Legacy Project for donating this lovely, lovely new restoration print. Um, restoration has been a topic recently with uh, digital and DCP and everything, so we're really happy to be able to show a 35 millimeter film. And we also have to remember that Restoration is not just about preserving film, but our stories. So I want to thank all of you for being here tonight to share that. Um, and I'd love to introduce our wonderful panelists. We're already here. So I'd love to introduce again Mr. Noah Eisenberg. Daniel Bettencourt. Ashley Spenerton. And Rob Epstein. Watch the chairs. They're not fully seated. Okay. All right. Uh, well, it's a real honor and pleasure to be here with you this evening uh, and to watch this film, which I've seen in a uh, previous incarnation uh, a number of years ago and have been taught in class. And it's extraordinary what UCLA uh, and Chris Horak the uh, preservationist behind this project was able to accomplish. And I wanted to ask Ashley at the outset just to get some insight into what goes in to film restoration, since this is not something that all of us, I can presume here in this, in this audience, this illustrious audience here tonight, would know about. So I thought we could maybe just turn for a bit to Ashley. What I'm going to do for the next 20 to 30 minutes is to speak with these distinguished uh, panelists here and then to open things up to you as well for a chance to ask questions. So if you have any burning questions, please hold on to those for just a moment and then we will open up the floor. But Ashley, first if you could just say a few words about film preservation, what goes into the kinds of decisions one makes, and specifically this particular picture, what, you know, the, the limited uh, uh, material that, that came from the uh, film museum in Russia, that they were then, that Chris Horak was able to work with, uh, you know, that was initially in, in kind of buried in Magnus Hirschfeld's film of 1927, Die Gesetze der Liebe, The Laws of Love, where he had repurposed some 40 minutes of footage from uh, Anders als die anderen, uh, different from the others in, in that great film. Sure. Um, well, thank you to Newfest and Outfest and UCLA. Um, I think when people think about film preservation and restoration, they think of, you know, side by side, this one's very dirty and scratched, and here, here's this one with brand new color, and it's, you know, it looks like it was just shot yesterday. In this case, that wasn't really the problem. The problem was that there was no film at all. So. Uh, the, the Nazis actually burned all of the, the original negatives and every print that they could find. So what we actually see here tonight is not different from the others. Uh, as Noah said, it's actually a different film uh, from 1927. So our distinguished sexologist, Magnus Hirschfeld, um, created a different film um, in 1927 and he pulled about 40 minutes of footage from different from the others and he spliced it and recut it and changed the order and uh, took out the air titles and um, put it into a film that was um, more of a, a scientific film, um, an educational film, not quite the narrative that we see here. And so the biggest challenge was first locating footage. So luckily Russia did have a print um, of the 1927 film, and from that uh, UCLA was able to create a what's called a fine grain master. It's a positive image, not a negative image. Um, and reorder the scenes, put them back into the order that they were more or less supposed to be. And this is based on censorship records and uh, Hirschfeld's own uh, notes that he had taken about the film and its reception. And um, they recreated intertitles um, to try to get them back to the, as close to the original uh, format and style as you would have seen in 1919. And some of the challenges that you face with uh, restoration, particularly with a foreign language film, is uh, one of translation. You know, what if your German uh, phrase doesn't quite translate into English? 
Uh, what if there's slang? What if there's offensive terms? You know, do you keep that um, to try to give the feel of what it would have been nearly 100 years ago, which you updated for modern art audiences? Um, so these are all decisions that you have to take into consideration when you're restoring a film. Uh, one of the biggest um, and surprises to me was the tinting, which was fantastic. I thought they did a great job with that. Um, and that's something that you see a lot with silent films, where there's an amber tint if it's a daylight film or a daylight scene, and then you know it's more blue color for night scenes. And if there's a fire, you know it's bright red. Um, so I think they did a really good job, um, in particularly in that aspect. Yeah, when this film uh, was released in Germany in 1919. Um, this was one of several productions on which the director, Richard Oswald, uh, was involved. He collaborated with Hirschfeld. Um, directly after Germany's loss in the First World War, there was a period when censorship was not being enforced. It lasted approximately a year, a year and a half. And what they made were called Aufklärungsfilme. These were uh, enlightenment, or sometimes in English we just simply call them social hygiene films, that, that had a kind of didactic message. And this was one of two that appeared that year. There was another one called the Constitution, the Prostitution, which also had starred Anita Barrow. We don't see her, the famous dancer. She plays Elsa in this film. You really barely catch a glimpse of her. Um, some of you may be familiar with Rosa von Braunheim's film called Anita, the uh, Tense of Lust, Anita, the Dances of Vice, um, that was devoted to her. I'm curious, though, so it's so much on the background of, uh, of this film and the different people who were involved, including Hirschfeld, and thanks to Hirschfeld, we, have, we now have the, the, uh, the film that we watched tonight. I'm curious, though, Manuel, as somebody who has followed uh, uh, LGBT festivals and has written on queer cinema over the years, um, how a film like this, when you watch it tonight, stacks up in comparison to some of the contemporary films. Uh, I, I, tonight, it's such a, uh, an honor to be on this panel, but my, my good friend Ira Sachs was, was, was otherwise to do this, and I was thinking about Love is Strange, actually, when watching certain scenes in this film. Some of you may be familiar with it? that picture. But I'd love if you could comment maybe about just the resonance that this film strikes nearly a century later. Well, it's, it's funny that you mentioned uh, Ira because um, the other film that keeps mind is actually his latest, is mm -hmm. Little Men. Because uh, I think um, the didactic uh, sort of aspect of the film, and maybe what seems most uh, sort of obvious, and it's sort of trying to teach you that homosexuality is not is not unnatural, and it's actually homophobia that's sort of taking um, sort of doing the most harm to people. But, but the scenes that always strike me uh, are those uh, boarding school scenes when we go back and sort of flash back and. Uh, I think it's because there's a moment where he puts his arm around this, uh, his like school boyfriend, and there's a moment where he looks up, and it almost looks like he's staring at us at the screen. Um, and those moments of like male intimacy uh, in, in younger sort of in, in younger men, uh, it's something that Ira sort of does in in, in Little Men, where there's like these two schoolboys who are getting to know each other, and it's it's become. Well, and since I saw this film, uh, again, prepping for, for tonight, I started seeing that trope all over again uh, in contemporary films. Uh, so if any of you want to see a great, also LGBT film this weekend that's not playing at the festival, but it's playing elsewhere, Moonlight um, also has this, uh, these wonderful scenes of what it means to have like this male friendship that, t that tilts towards uh, the romantic and almost the, the erotic. and. That's, I think, where uh, the contemporaneity uh, or the resonance of, that a film like different from the others, uh, in that it's not only making this argument of like this born this way or the genetic or the biology, um, but it's also trying to sort of really wrest sexuality away from you know thinking that it's this adult thing that it's something that happens later in life, but it's something that's that's already there and that we can tap into. It's also the Dirk Bogart film Victim, right, which is somewhat related. Mm -hmm. This theme. Yeah, and, and as for those, those boarding school, the flashback, I also couldn't help, especially when thinking about this, specifically about this period, think of Leontina Sagan's film, one of the talkies, Machin and Uniform, that takes play from the, then we have this uh, uh, young, young girl's uh, uh, boarding school and, and, and the erotic love that, 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 that is forbidden, actually, uh, again. And which leads me to the question of the forbidden love and forbidden attraction, leads me to this. this, this uh, 
very controversial paragraph 175, about which Rob has devoted an entire film, focusing specifically on the Nazi period, but maybe you could talk, especially since you spent so much time working on that film that came out in 2000, um, and you'll have a chance to watch it tomorrow at 10.30 across the street. Um, but maybe you could speak a, a bit about, about the significance of paragraph 175. 